a gifted pastor, teacher, and leader. A.J. Sherrill has over 15 years of pastoral experience in diverse church settings across the nation. He's the author of Enneagram and the Way of Jesus, Quiet, Hearing God Amidst the Noise, and his latest book, Expansive, Stretching Beyond Superficial Christianity. A.J. holds two master's degrees in theology and a doctorate from Fuller Theological Seminary and is currently lead pastor at Mars Hill in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He joins us in this conversation today as we talk about his latest book, Expansive. Hi, I'm Ashton Gustafson, and this is good, true, and beautiful. Hey guys, welcome back. Hope you are doing well. Super excited today uh, to have back one of our good friends, A.J. Sherrill from Grand Rapids, Michigan. A.J.'s been a guy that... um, I have watched from afar and just, uh, we've never met in person, but I can tell you uh, the way he leads his life, the way he navigates his days, uh, the way that he leads the people that he's been entrusted at Mars Hill, it's just been a beautiful thing to watch. And so um, out of his spirit of generosity, he said he would come back on and chat with us today. He's got a new book out called Expansive, and we're going to chat about that. Um, But that being said, AJ, welcome back. Hey man, round two with Ashton Gustafson. What a privilege. <laughs> I'm pumped to get this crossed off my bucket list. Yes. Well, um, this is probably no way to begin a podcast, and this is totally off script, but you have the greatest um, auto responder email that I've come across. Um, it, it's, it, I showed this to my wife last night and I was like, I would give anything to be able to have this as my auto responder. And she goes, I don't know how long I can keep it. I I haven't been pressed on it yet, but, uh, I'm going to go as long as I can before my elders make me take it down. Well, in short for our listeners, I won't read it verbatim, but it basically goes, Hey, uh, I'm doing good and necessary work in the world, which means I'm not going to check this thing every five minutes. Um, that's the that's the synopsis of it. Um, that's a bit reaching. I think I'm <laughs> I'm just doing some downtime uh, and not responding to the technological moment, uh, whether it's necessary and good work that right. remains to be seen. Well, um, I can tell you, it's uh, somehow I'm going to take something from that and put it in place in my own life. I just don't know how I can get away from it. Um, but it was beautiful. I digress. Um, so what's new in Grand Rapids? We've got uh, you. How long now have you been at Mars Hill? Is it about almost two years, year and a half? How long you been there? Yeah, I think we're right at a year and a half right now. And um, kind of a new place. You've moved around a bit. Um, it's cold, I would assume. Um, uh, what's what do you what do you know that you didn't know um, after being there for a year and a half or so? Well, I moved from a culture in New York City from hyper transience to a culture in Grand Rapids of hyper permanence, and um, it's a it's a quaint little town. And people that have lived in a cities such as New York, L.A., San Fran, um, a lot of people are finding the cost. Uh, it's just cost prohibitive long term, especially with family. So cities like Grand Rapids, um, Nashville's been such a boom as well as Portland. Just these awesome cities just emerging and Grand Rapids is kind of trailing on that, on those tails. And so uh, just seeing a lot of culture develop here and it's been really fun to see um, GR just evolve and grow and see diversity come to this part of the country in the Midwest. And uh, I'm really grateful for that. Beautiful. Well, um, when we, when we talk about you and your work, uh, I know you've written one, one of the books I love was uh, kind of about stillness and solitude. Another one, uh, was on the Enneagram, kind of through the lens of Jesus. Um, and then you've got this new book called Expansive. And I just kind of wanted to um, introduce it to our listeners, because I think, um, I mean, as I went through my notes uh, a couple days ago in preparing for this, I mean, it was just line after line after line of things that I underlined, beautiful insight. Um, where do you begin when you kind of introduce the, the the big why behind uh, writing Expansive? Yeah, I, th- I think a really huge paradigm shift for me, um, this this sort of phrase, follow the cosmos. Uh, I yes. remember Mike, Mike McCarr, Science Mike, if you will, uh, he's a, a friend of mine, and he, he spoke here um, shortly after I moved to, to Grand Rapids. I wanted to have him in because I was doing this series on psalms and stars and the physics of spirituality and all that stuff, and so trying to integrate that, that if – if, if God is love and love is the fabric of the cosmos, 
what can we learn about this God and about ourselves through mm. the universe itself? And lo and behold, the universe, uh, I mean, one of the theories right now that I think is really beautiful, whether it's true or not, I think it's true. <laughs> and whether it's not, I, I like what I, what's derivative. And it's that the universe is expanding. It's expansive. So what might that mean about even our own mm. um, dynamism as humans? What does it mean to not be a static entity? Um, so that's sort of the, the high side of it, really the low side of why it was sort of conceived was um, sort of a haunting discontent. Hmm. Uh, I have, I'm in a place and I've been in a place for a while where, and I don't think I'm alone in this. There's a discontent with the character of the cultural moment. Uh, There's a discontent with the character of the church. uh, And there's a discontent with the character of my own life. And Hmm. um, I'm just coming to a place that if, if we're going to change the world, we have to start with ourselves. Yeah. And um, and so what does it mean to take transformation seriously instead of scapegoating, looking, taking a hard look within and saying, how am I called to expand for the sake of the world? Yeah. How am I not called to just hunch down? There's this phrase homo incurvatus, which is the idea that we sort of curl in on ourselves and just protect. Hmm. But that's not how we were made. Yeah. We were made yeah. um, to expand. We were made to grow. We were made. And, and I think on that journey is where flourishing happens. Um, so I'm interested in that. And, you know, not only is the universe expanding, uh, but the, the degree, the rate at which it's expanding is, is, <laughs> right. is, uh, multiplying, um, yeah. which is a whole nother mind blowing thing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I love that. I love you quote, you tweeted that sometime in the last week or so that follow the cosmos or something like that. Um, forget who said it, but that sure does, uh, create a beautiful posture, which this book is about posture, I think. I mean, I, I, your, your tone um, really is, how are you going to be in the world? And and I think yeah. it came out of, is it the values of Mars Hill? Hold my hand there as you kind of, you know, because it's, it's about these seven directions, movements, postures, those being inward, upward, withward, outward, backward, forward, and downward. You, this wasn't something that you necessarily uh, showed up with uh, at Mars Hill, it was kind of the the values that they had, and maybe your mm-hmm. time walking with those values. Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been really transformed. It's given me handles to take a real honest look in my life and say, okay, where am I? Where am I nailing it? Hmm. Uh, and that has a lot to do with personality. Um, it has a lot to do with background and experience. And then, where am I not nailing it? Where do I omit? transformation because yeah. um for some it's easy to go inward and be in solitude and you just kind of reject withward which is the idea of community uh for some it's easy to do upward and like worship is easy for you and transcendence and for others uh it's easy to omit something like um well i mean pick one of the directions outward where you neglect the poor and so um there these directions are annoying <laughs> and and they sort of remind us that whoa I have so far to go, hmm. and I'm asking questions like as a as a as a pastor as a priest is how can the church in the 21st century be less harmful and more helpful? Hmm. And I think that has a lot to do with taking a deep look within and doing something about it for the sake of the world. I think I think we have a character problem, right? I mean, yeah. have, you, have you read the headlines, yeah. especially about the church and the state of the church? Um, but we're not called to despair. I think we're called to be dynamic and not static. So it's expansive, you might say. Yeah. And, um, you kind of begin the book with the conversation of, um, humans being made in the image of God and these seven directions, these seven postures, they are the way in which we transform into God's likeness. Mm -hmm. Hold my hand on that because I think sometimes some people, have some confusion here of image and likeness. I know Richard Rohr this year is sending out his big conversation is about image and likeness, but Mm -hmm. um, we're all made in the image. The question about transformation uh, is becoming, uh, you know, Christ-like. Walk with me on that. Yeah, I mean, I borrowed a lot of my ideas from um, just being immersed in Eastern Orthodox theology uh, years ago. Uh, particularly with the doctrine of theosis, which we don't have to digress into that. But essentially, I found these brilliant Eastern thinkers that uh, frame the conversation that we 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 basically we're, we're complex as a species. Um, humans are beautiful and humans are broken. And what we share in common is twofold. Number one, we have God's image and should be treated as such, all yeah. of us. Yeah. 
But number two, we're in search of God's likeness and that this search is the meaning of life. Um, this quest to reclaim what's been lost and forgotten and, um, and needs uh, cultivation, I think, is, is this idea that how do – if we have the seed of God's image within us and, and we present that image wherever we go, how do we also transform into that likeness? It's almost like growing into who you already are. Mm. Um, and so I'm interested in that because, you know, so much of church life and spirituality today, it, it basically comes down to this. At the end of the day, the last two talking points are do more and right. try harder. Yeah. And yeah. so this is sort of an invitation to say there's actually what you need is already planted within <laughs> who you are. It's in your DNA. And so how do we how do we become it's available who we already are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, now. Would you also say that this transformation into likeness, this is a conversation I've been having with some friends, is the litmus test of this, the fruits of the Spirit? Um, Because a lot of the religious food fights happen, right, over what do you think about this and what do you think about that? And I've found a very healthy place for me to stand in a lot of what can be, quote-unquote, hot topics, is Mm -hmm. um, am I becoming more loving here? Is there more yeah. goodness happening here? Is there more kindness uh, going on? As as we are called to this transformation, would you say that that's a gr- that's a good place to go? If you're if you're wondering what does transformation look like, hopefully it's pointed in in this direction. Yeah, uh, th- this is a bit controversial. I'll just I'll, I've never seen more angry peacemakers. Not like a a good <laughs> Jesus turning table anger. Right. Like more of like a self righteous scapegoat anger than I have in the yeah. last yeah. I would say year. Yeah. I, I, and I, I don't know that the radical right and the radical left have ever shared less in common in mm. position, yeah. but more in common in posture yeah. than ever before. I totally agree. It's like agree with me or else. Um, agree with me on my issues, and and if you don't, then you're going to be villainized, and I'm the victim. And there's some of that that I get, where there's oppression and dehumanization, and that that stuff needs to be called out. But it seems like we're in an issues centric moment, where we're just continuing to diversify ourselves and um, and create insiders outsiders based yeah. on um, based on issues that are significant. Yeah. But maybe not central to saying, are you or are you not the image of God? And what if my first step toward everyone is toward you and not away from you based on your opinions? I think yeah. opinions are easy. I think formation is hard. Hmm. Yeah, you, and so, yeah. Yeah, yeah you wrote that um, this is about radical intention. The, these postures are about approaching your days with intentionality. And I loved this quote. You said, it's not about earning but it does require effort. Um, so when you talk about these postures, these seven directions of leading an intentional life, um, what do you mean it's not about earning, but it does require effort? Yeah, you know, again, like, and that's a Dallas Willard, um, I, I, that's a Dallas Willard mm-hmm. quote, um, where, again, it's back to the image, is that it's, the image of God is in you, and, I think one of the things that's helpful is to put ourselves in an agricultural framework, which is really hard in a sort of a post enlightenment industrial world. Um, I'm constantly trying to remind myself first. And then this little community I'm a part of that we are soil. We are not machinery. Hmm. Um, That's good. And so that, that gives you permission to be on this journey of this quest for likeness, but also it, it says like, Hey, listen, um, we're not just soil, but we're also farmers and we need cultivating and so what does it look like to pay attention? What does it look like to water and to soil and to prune? Um, I, I was told um, at uh, – my wife and I love to travel to wineries and to wine regions. And I was told at one wine region um, in Virginia uh, where they make really good Viognier right now that it takes at least 16 years to produce a kind of quality grape that makes a drinkable wine. Wow. And I'm just thinking like, wow, like imagine the vision you have to have for your life yep. and for that kind of a sip that you would be willing to invest and prune and cultivate and till for 16 years in order to produce something worthwhile for the mm-hmm. world. And I, I think it's that sort of thing is a radical intention of focus. I mean, we love um, seeing everybody best in class. Like 
you know, whether it's uh, Roger Federer serve yeah. like that took place in the dark <laughs> with so much effort for him yeah. to cultivate that kind of artistry toward the game of tennis. That's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That life um, happens in the hidden, in the unseen moments in intentionality that um, it's process. Uh, mm-hmm. There's time, there's process, of course, must be patience. Um, and even just the whole metaphor of garden and tilling the soil. I, I think if we can hang out near those metaphors, we'll be patient with ourselves and everyone else as well. Yeah. And a, a couple of things with that too, that, that, um, I think transformation, um, God uses every means necessary. So like the ingredients of life, conversations, workmates, family, conflict, it's all, mm. it's all meaningful. Yeah. For yeah, that cultivation, that good. friction that we experience at times, conflict is opportunity. And then the last P that I think we've forgotten is is practices. Yeah, um, yeah. having practices that you are going to show up to and know that uh, no matter what happens, I'm going to show up and I'm going to give myself to this time in this way at this place because I just believe over the course of time something deeper will be cultivated than if I just live impromptu throughout my whole life yeah. reacting in every way i think it's the emerson quote things happen gradually then suddenly um i think i think that holds very true um so each chapter each of these seven directions movements postures you kind of break down you, you give a story you uh you cite some scripture you provide some structure which i think thought was a brilliant way to do this and then you do end with that practice you kind of go okay now that we've talked through this, here's a way to approach this. Here's a prayer. Here's something to think about this week. Um, let's kind of waltz through some of these. Um, and not to take too much thunder from the book, because I want people to go get it, but the first posture or direction being inward. Um, and again, you know, you wrote a beautiful book on quiet uh, that was about solitude, stillness, and silence. And I wanted to read this sentence uh, or this paragraph, because I thought it was brilliant when we talk about the position uh, of looking, looking inward in our lives. You said there are connections between depth and solitude, clarity and stillness, identity and silence. Sadly, within our increasingly meritocra tetraconic world, I totally botched that, many of those connections are being severed, and we are subconsciously compliant every step of the way. We reap what we sow. Rejecting depth, we seek immediacy. Fearing shame, we flee solitude. Snubbing silence, we prefer noise. Neglecting stillness, we've become human-sized fidget spinners. Dude, it's like a home run of writing. Um, Walk with me in in what you know about the inward posture. Um, in, In a world where... It's about retweets and at mentions and likes and and everything mm. else. This this work back. What are you? How are, how are you and the people you've been entrusted at Mars Hill taking on mm-hmm. this conversation of inward? Yeah, um, Bonavere was my example story oh, for dude. that chapter. I of... went. To, I went. I saw him two times this last week. It was amazing. It was incredible. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I remember learning the story of D'Armin Edison, which was the band uh, that he was in uh, before just catastrophe hit um, that gave rise to what we now know as Bon Iver. Um, and, you know, a lot of times um, I think we live in such a world where silence and solitude, they eventually catch up to us one way or yes. another. Yeah. Um, and it's in those spaces where I think, just like a soil that's fallow. I think we just assume like winter we're called to endure it. Mm -hmm. And if we can, if we can endure it, then finally we can get outside again and enjoy the fruit of summer. But even like the winter seasons of life, or maybe we'll call that solitude, or maybe we'll call that depression, or maybe we'll call that whatever, um, that there's work happening and we're called to cooperate with that work in such a way that, um, that new things can be forged. Um, I, you know, my greatest aim of the day uh, isn't to achieve it's it's to receive and i could only do that when i put myself in a sort of posture that's good to receive the love of god romans 5 has this awesome verse um you know we, we often think romans 5 or the book of romans is just like a, a guide to get us somewhere when we die and it's such a crass <laughs> uh, underestimation of what 
I think the mystic Paul's trying to do here, which he says this verse that sort of has been forgotten. It's is that God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given. Like I love this water yeah. imagery of yeah. the love of God being poured out, not just generally, but specifically into our hearts. That's good. And it's in the silence and the solitude that I think I become most aware that that's happening. Yeah. Um, Pink Floyd, do you remember the the um, the art for the dark side of the moon? Yes. Remember that prism? It's yes. So awesome. I've been re- since you brought up the fruit of the spirit. Like I've been rethinking how we talk about, think about the fruit of the spirit. Like imagine that you know it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, etc. Imagine what if what if the front side of that prism, that light coming in, is love. Hmm. And it gets refracted in all of these other ways, like joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. Yeah. Now, I know yeah. like love or agapetos, it has a specific meaning. But I've just been thinking like, what if the goal of life is to receive God's love in such a way that I can refract it in all of these colors throughout my day that people can experience good news good. through the love of God in my life in patience and self-control? Like for my daughter to say, my dad is so kind. Um, he's so patient. That I think is is going to happen when I'm discontent with um, my current state of character and say I need God I need to sit in your love long yeah. enough to become this kind of person. Yeah. Yes. Totally agree. And I am going to go check out the Pink Floyd image and dwell on the fruit. <laughs> yeah. It's fantastic. Um, the next one being upward, uh, and you write the best way to flourish is to begin in adoration. Um, yeah. So so walk me through the posture of upward. Um, and when we began, you kind of said for some people, it's easy to, to be in a state of worship for some, it's yeah. not. Um, yeah. what do you mean in this, in this stance? I mean, it's a rejection of disenchantment disenchantment. It's, you mm. know, Charles Taylor has just been prolific in this in recent years. Uh, so I begin my day, I call it shower transcendence. And, uh, I'm glad your listeners can't see me cause I want to spare them of a visual, but I, I will, I will literally, I, lo- I love showers, this by the way, this is a, this is the, a beautiful practice. The shower is the first thing I do every day. And we all know how we feel in the shower. I mean, we're just not even, you know, cognizant of anything. And I will, in in sort of like uh, holy defiance over, um, uh, a disenchantment world and worldview, I, I will put my hands up in the air and um, express love to God. Uh, mm. I often won't sing because that would just be really hard the first thing of the day. But it's a way of me putting my body in such a place where I can, it can remind my, my mind that there is more happening yeah. in, in the universe than brushing your teeth and, and, and between like that argument or whatever. You right. Know? Yes. Yeah. And, and I love the bodily uh, kind of, medium that you put into this chapter you wrote it's very difficult to be be in agreement with what god wants for us when the posture of our minds hearts and bodies are closed in on themselves um so even that practice each morning for you beginning in that posture of adoration i often say where you begin is going to tell us a lot about where you end with your day um Mm. and and so i think for you to do that and t- for you to bodily process that um, has to set a beautiful tone and, and give you, I guess, give uh, the prism some availability to uh, receive some of that yeah. light. Yeah, I think it's incredible how much our, you know, just to speak metaphorically, our hearts and our minds are, you know, in our bodies, they all sort of are interdependent on one another. And there are just times where my heart and mind don't think or feel something like my body can lead my life and it can reinform and re sort of transform and re hardwire um, That's That's my day. And yeah. so it's, it's just a really simple liturgy for me to start my day in that posture. Yeah. Yeah. Withward, the next stance of being withward. And I loved the um, kind of the, the, the scientific background you gave us about trees and their connection with the soil. Um, yeah. And uh, you kind of posed this question of like, what could the trees be teaching us? Um, when you when you talk about Withward and you talk about community and friendship, um, how are you guys uh, h- handling this dialogue uh, right now when you talk about Withward? Yeah, I mean, I, I again, I mean, because if we're going to follow the cosmos in one way, we need to follow the 
depth of the soil and the other, that there's this amazing network of interconnectivity happening in fungi. Total symphony. Underneath the soil. It's an, yeah. It's an, and, and it's somehow like we've moved beyond that to live like more enlightened lives. And I think we've just, we've missed the idea of friendship being um, what happens, the spark that happens when we truly orient our life towards seeing another and walking with them. That's good. And I, I think with word, the community aspect, that's a made up word that I think Rob Bell and Sean Aniquist came up with. That I just think is it's hilarious. And um, it pushes against the idea of friendship as a market exchange, hmm. um, which you see a lot when I, I lived in New York, it was like, you show up because you have something to offer me and um, we can sort of make that deal. And it's implicit, but it's, it's sinister. It's nefarious. And no it just, such thing as a free lunch. Yeah. And <laughs> And when market exchange is our definition of love, quid pro quo, you do this, I'll do that. Um, it just, it, that's not genuine yep. friendship. Yep. Um, and that's not spark, that's favors. And uh, I, I think we have a lot to learn. And again, this relates back to issues. Like if you agree with me on this stuff, then we can be friends. And what's like studies showing us, they're, they're showing us that the most flourishing business environments are those with diverse opinions yeah. that can stack hands on a couple things and say, this unites us and let's leave room for difference yeah. and let's dignify our differences in one another yeah. and see each other's perspective um, as, as, as uh, plausible, but also maybe I could learn some things and change my own view over the course of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's really good. Um, I had never really thought about it in that way in terms of like also even spanning into business and other forms of culture that it's the, the wanting the O N E I N G of all things, mm -hmm. um, is really the dialogue around this withward conversation. Uh, next one being outward, uh, to which you called holy empathy. Um, and you basically said if inconvenience and diversity isn't a part of it, then it's probably not outward. Um, Talk to me about this posture, this intentionality of our lives. Yeah, this is the one that gets away from me um, because I have uh, a really um, sort of a temptation to to read and to teach and to be here at the church and um, and to not actually be facing. I can I can equip and help make things happen and release funds and support teams, et cetera, et cetera, and start nonprofits, but. Um, I, I realized this year, oh my goodness, who has a story to share of me showing up in their life? Hmm. And that's hmm. not about like me justifying myself. It's me saying, okay, I'm, I myself am called to be a participant in this world and to be a part of receiving as well from, from others that, um, where there's just a mutuality and, um, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I, I, I think, um, so I got involved with this fifth grader. I, I spend time with him once a week and he um, just teaches me a lot of what it means to laugh and be human. And I, I have this, um, this suspicion that what happens, like imagine these four words, sympathy, empathy, solidarity, generosity, sympathy, empathy, solidarity, generosity. What happens is that we can be at a place where we have sympathy for people. Right. And so we move to generosity and we forget these two things in between called empathy and solidarity. Mm. And what can happen when we move from sympathy to generosity without having to practice empathy, without having to be in solidarity, is that we short circuit our own transformation. Yeah. Yeah. So like you can give to nonprof, you can you can cut a check, you can be philanthropic, and yet you can be a real asshole. Yeah. And so I'm really interested in saying like I I want to <laughs> I want to care about yeah. The, I want to care about the problems of Grand Rapids, and I'm a problem in Grand Rapids. So how do we, <laughs> how do we care for one another in such a way that we can be transformed, and that I can be a part of it and not just um, a mobilizer, if you will. Without those middle two, does does the relationship stay somewhat subject to object, rather than I think so. Yeah, rather than yeah. being subject to subject. Yeah, I vow certainly never comes up. Yeah, and yep. Uh, yep. it's easy to to be very self righteous when you're cutting checks. And when you're on a board, but you're not actually involved. Mm. Sympathy, yeah. empathy, solidarity, generosity. Yeah, yeah, man, that's good. That's really good. Um, 
I hadn't thought about that as, as we, you know, try to enter those moments subject to subject with people, especially people that aren't like us. Um, mm-hmm. But if we skip those two, and what were the middle two again? I just want to hear them again. Empathy. Yeah. Empathy and solidarity. Empathy and solidarity. That's salty. That's really good. Um, next position being backward. Uh, and, and this is, this is kind of, this was my jam. This was the chapter that I loved kind of looking backwards, uh, at tradition, um, kind of my personal journey of discovering some of this stuff that's been available all along. And I just never knew about it. Um, and you, you wrote that tradition is not to preserve the ashes, but to pass on the flame. I forget who said that, but, um, yeah, Gustav Mahler. Yes. The- and, the composer. And, and then this was this was the sentence that I loved though. It's not so much that God does new novel things, but more that God does uh, n- does new fresh things. Um, just love that. So when you talk about tradition uh, and th- that sometimes we do need to connect the dots looking backwards, um, how are you guys moving into this conversation of? Hey, there's mm-hmm. there's some people 500, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago that were doing really, really beautiful, intentional things, and we need to learn from them. Yeah. I mean, we have um, – we're, we're specifically historic. Like, we're as uh, – um, as a church, like, not trying to be novel as much as we're trying to be faithful. And I, the, the pressure cooker of, um, of performance and trying to um, – you know, if you're in my position as a priest or a clergy, or if you're a religious leader, it's like, it's awful Mm -hmm. just how much you feel like Sundays come around and impress me or else and say something I've never heard before and blow my mind or, and, and you realize that's not a healthy diet long-term if you're going to stay in this kind of work and it's not healthy for anybody really. Um, So that's where sacraments are really important. It's where liturgies and confessions are important. Um, and so there's a place for those things. There's a rightful place. There's also a misuse of those places where all we care about is, you know, and I call that the trellis, um, which, you know, I go into in the book. But, um, you know, we're just in a moment where novelty is sort of everything. We need a new iPhone every 10 minutes. Yep. That's the upgrade. And that's really dangerous when it comes to a spiritual diet. I mean, imagine imagine it being like this. Every spring comes around. And what I say to myself is, oh, my goodness, there's the tulip again. How beautiful. What I don't say is, wow, there's a tulip, and I've seen that color. Mm. That's so disappointing. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 that in of itself is so connecting and yeah. so beautiful. Like, why do we have such freedom and generosity toward agriculture and such um, crazy expectations on ourselves yeah. to produce new things all the time? rather than resting in some of the things that or resting in the story that has been told and the grandfather, the grandmother passing down that beautiful tradition that we can, yeah, we can find new contours for it, but there's also some things that we need to find continuity with. Mm, Totally. Where past meets present. Oh, I think, yes, absolutely. And and in fact, GK Chesterton talks about this with the sunrise, you know, he says like, you know, God, what if God's always saying, Oh, do it again. Do it again, you know, <laughs> and he says at the end, he says, it may be that God has an eternal appetite for infancy, oh, for we have sinned go. and grown old and our father is younger than we. Yes. It's like, oh, it's so good. Yes. yes. The beginner's mind. Never leave it. Um, yeah. When we've, when we've grown weary of the marvel of a sunset, there's something wrong with, um, our expectation. There's yeah. something a bit unnatural about needing uh, lasers in the sky mm-hmm. rather than the constellations being enough to draw us into awe and wonder. That's a good word. That is a good word. Um, follow the cosmos once again. Um, forward, the next, the next posture, the next direction. Um, and, and this one was interesting. You, you talk about propelling forward in power, but that we must be properly aligned. Um, yeah. To talk about the forward direction because um, it is, it, yeah, I just want to hear it because I, I feel like with this forward direction, this one can be a little dangerous. Uh, if we're not yeah. first, we're last. If we're not growing, we're dying. Like, uh, yeah. you know, hold my hand here. Yeah, there's, there's, two, there's two sort of understandings. Um, uh, that are both right. I think number one, take the next step, whoever you are, wherever you are, life's a journey. 
Yeah. Take yeah. the next step, you know, and doubt is a part of the equation. Totally. And, um, but doubt isn't the goal. There's a step beyond doubt and it's not called certitude. It's called trust. Yes. And, um, yes. and we have to trust even in the midst of mystery and to not, to not take that step is to actually to decide to trust in not taking the step. Mm. Um, so take the next step in your journey, whatever that is. But what I'm more interested in is I am, um, I'm deeply desirous for, um, for more, whatever that is, however God wants to do more, whatever the spirit wants to do in my life to expand me. Um, so my understanding of let's take the resurrection of Jesus, um, is that that was a first fruit. And what we know about the first fruit is that more should be expected and more shouldn't be expected, um, down the road, like the festival of first fruits that the Jews have, you don't give your first fruit to God and starve that next season. You give your first fruit to God, which is an act of trust, believing that the God who did that first fruit will, on the heels of that, produce more fruit. Hmm. So let me just sort of bring this and land the plane here. The first fruit of the resurrection means that we should expect more of resurrection kind of life happening now. And it's not about sort of clamping down and controlling life experience and going somewhere after we die. It's about saying, how is the future moving toward my present? If the future of all things is, is reconciliation and renewal and um, union, wanting, then, let's get then it how now. do I, yeah, how do I begin to act in conjunction? And, and I think that's what the Beatitudes are about, yeah. of taking God's worldview seriously. And if we were to take God's worldview seriously, the, the world might be a very different place. So it, it may be God saying, hey, just try this on. And you're going to see that hmm. it's not it's not um, rational, it's but it's paradoxical. It, yeah. it will make sense, but some things have to be trusted in in order to be understood. You know, yeah. fides quarens intellectum is how the ancients have said that that you have to sort of believe in order to understand. And it's not like you know Disney, um, <laughs> but it is a sense of saying right. I think more is happening here than than what the sort of modern enlightenment paradigm has told me that there is a transcendent possibility in all situations. Yeah. Yeah. And so the other, and this is huge. The other side of doubt isn't certitude. It's trust. Yeah. To trust that we're being held to uh, to trust that we're being pulled towards more union towards, um, you know, all those fruits of the spirit, just to trust that process um, I think that's a beautiful conversation about this forward posture. And then the last one, downward, the the way of descent. Um, and I really think the, the best line of the book is this one right here. Our egos are so often overdeveloped that it takes a crisis to get our attention. Um, dude, like that was my story. Um, <laughs> so, so good. The, the way of the descent, very Franciscan, by the way. Um, yeah. So walk with us in this posture in the world that, um, I mean, this is to find your life, you got to lose it unless the grain of wheat dies. Um, yeah. you find, you find it amongst the least of these. Um, how are you guys moving into this conversation? Yeah. So our, I'll just make it really practical and, um, just allow, uh, the listener to fill in the blanks in their own life, how I'm learning this. And it's, it's hard is I'm constantly saying to my staff, here's my thought, but I'm willing to lose. Hmm. Um, That's good. And it's, it's that, it's that posture of being willing to lose that I think makes longevity and friendship and deepening and formation possible. I mean, it's exactly what Jesus modeled out. I mean, even in the garden where he's praying, like, you know, another way of saying, Lord, as you will, another way of saying is, here's my preference. I'm willing to lose. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that posture was the pivot in which human history sort of took a swing and yeah. went in another direction. And, um, and I think that that's not just vicarious of, Oh, isn't that great that Jesus did that? It's to say, no, that that's actually modeling out what it looks like to change the world. Mm-hmm. And that, that we are called to participate in that kind of ethic where, I have opinions and I care about issues, um, but wow, I'm willing to lose and to listen and I'm willing to um, dignify our differences and, and to model out humility. Um, I don't remember um, if it was, I don't think it was Anthony. It might've been Bernard of Clairvaux when he was asked what the four cardinal virtues are or what their order is. Right. 
of um, you know of, of prudence and temperance and you know the four virtues and he looked at the novice and he said to him the four cardinal virtues in order are humility 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 and humility <laughs> and I thought oh my goodness if ever if ever a society needed to hear that if yeah. ever a soul needed to hear that it's mine yeah um, and so I. I just choose to believe that the Philippian hymn from Philippians chapter two of this way of Jesus, this downward descent is what actually does lead us upward in the mm. end. Um, but that's not intuitive. Right. Right. And I love, I mean, even from a, um, a vulnerability and leadership uh, position of, of, of how yeah. you, you open with that dialogue. I mean, that is a, for, for those listeners that are leaders um, for you to just go, Hey, I, I got a stance here, but I'm willing to be wrong. I'm, I'm really, I'm willing to let it go. Um, yeah. shows great humility and vulnerability. Um, I think, was it Merton that said like life is a charted dance of humiliation mm. after humiliation, something yeah. like that. Like the path, <laughs> the path to transformation is just one humiliation yes. after another. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yes. Man. That's right. I love it. So, um, my assumption is this book can be bought anywhere. Good books are bought and sold. Amazon, any place specifically you would send us? No, this is a self pub because I I wanted my church to have it um, so that it didn't have to be edited by an outside agency awesome. and fit into that script. So you can get it on Amazon. It's probably not going to be at a bookstore unless they've purchased it. Um, and also, I'll just say like if it's helpful, uh, you know, maybe help me put it out there. So. For sure. I mean, it's it's um, such a good read. It's a book I will revisit uh, a number of times, and I think the listeners today can hear uh, the passion that AJ brings, even in this dialogue. It comes out on the pages. He's a gifted writer, a uh, great communicator. Um, so expansive. It's out. What else, man? What's keeping you curious? I, this is what I, I really want to know. Is it you got any new books, any new music you're chasing? Um, what's keeping AJ curious? Uh, I think our national moment is not just keeping me curious. It's keeping me exhausted. I <laughs> think all the time about, um, how, again, how, how the, the weakness of the church's character is, um, we should be leading the way in humility and bringing mm-hmm. people together. And, um, what's keeping me curious is how we, f- how I am formed and how we are formed in a little local church in Grand Rapids, um, not for ourselves, for self-preservation, but that our formation is um, for the sake of the world. And um, I deeply want to see the church once again move into not just being a thought leader, but um, like a, a wisdom bringer on humility and, um, and unity. And so um, I, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a pretty hard, grievous like season of, um, of just longing and sort of a holy discontent. And so mm. I know a lot of people are, and it's just been a hard sort of season for a lot of people. It seems like, at least that's what I keep reading. Yep. Yep. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for the work you're doing, Ashton. I feel like a lot of um, the things and conversations you're cultivating are people that care about that space too. And um, I'm longing for a better and more beautiful world. Yeah. Yeah. What is, uh, what is your sense for our first step, a collective um, first step together as we talk about, you know, moving forward as a body. Yeah. Um, you have any thoughts there? Yeah. We got to put down our boxing gloves. Let's go. Yeah. Um, yeah. we got to take the gloves off and that isn't to get harder with our knuckles. It's to say, let's, let's just put our stance down. Hmm. Um, and that, that doesn't start with scapegoating the me too moment and laughing Weinstein and, spacing them out of the building is to say, well, how have I contributed to this mess? Hmm. Because, um, cause I, I lust and I gossip and, um, and I'm greedy. And so I got to take a hard look within to say, man, we got some work to do and I'm, I'm up for it. Who's, who's on the ride. Let's do this. That's good. Oh man. And I'd say that's a beautiful wrap. Um, AJ, so thankful for you, man. Um, your voice at our table is uh we love it um and i hope i can get you on uh for uh 3.0 sometime when you <laughs> do it again awesome man. My, my pleasure okay brother we'll talk soon hope you guys enjoyed this conversation with aj make sure you go online get a copy of his latest book at amazon expansive you can also find his teachings at marshill.org and as you approach this week 
May you pause by the orchid, listen to the bluebird sing, and be loved. Hey, before we go, would you guys please go to iTunes? Uh, We'd love for you to leave us a review. Our goal here at Good, True, and Beautiful is to get these conversations in as many hands as we can as possible. And by you leaving a review, you will be doing your little part in helping get the word out about what we're doing here at Good, True, and Beautiful. Until next time.